have tremendous charm and vim and um, there are different ways, there are different ways of looking at the world. Um, and I, I might be heresy as far as you're concerned, but I thought, for example, the first one or two series of, of Big Brother were very interesting. I didn't watch all of them. I watched two or three of them to see what the fuss was about. And I thought, I, that's quite interesting. What they're doing, they're, these young people are trying to work out a different sort of hierarchy. It isn't based on class, it isn't based on money, it isn't based on... They're working out who's... And they're working it out on who's most sincere. It's to do with who's the most sincere person in the room. And it, I thought it was quite interesting. They've now become, I think, too self-conscious and hammy and extreme, and consequently it's, it's, it's less and less interest. Um, the reality shows of searching for a star, um, well, the opportunity knocks and all that. So I've always been a sucker for that, so... Um, I don't watch it a great deal, but when I do watch it, I enjoy it. People now want to be more and more involved. They don't want to be talked at. They, do, they want to be interactive, to use that word. And I understand that. When, when in the, 30, 40 years ago, when you used to go to literary festivals, of which there were very few in those days, indeed, you'd talk, and then it was kind of over, really, and that was it, or read, or whatever it was. And now you go, and you talk for about half the time, and then people want to question you. But, or question each other for their other hand. And that's terrific. And, and the questions are very good. Um, but it's, it's a quite a big change. We're not going to be talked to for now. We, we, that was then, it's not now. And the other thing is the terrestrial channels are, are seeking around restlessly and rather frantically sometimes to get hold, to keep hold of the mass audience that they used to hold so effortlessly. But now the mass audience is, is fragmented the 400 channels and although some of them are only getting a few tens of thousands it adds up to millions drifting away so I don't know what you think that's, that, that's my experience. Well I, I agree with you about the the early big brothers I, mean, I, I found them fascinating it was almost through the looking glass wasn't it and the public seems to demand more and more intimacy from public figures like yourself more access to the story of Melvin Bragg behind the television personality and you have been very open recently in, in discuss, discussing, for example, I think an intermittent struggle you, you've had over the years with depression. Is that, in a way, a response to that dynamic of need from the public? Um, well, that's a good question. It came out accidentally. I didn't want to talk about it at all. But curious enough, it came out in an interview, rather like this. Um, I was talking to... Mark Lawson, many years ago now, uh, about religion. Uh, I was brought up as a very strong Christian. And he was asking about the soul. And I said, oh. And then I described something that had happened to me as an early teenager, between 12 and 14, where part of my head, and I didn't know what it was, would literally seem to float away and go into the corner of a room. And it was a light, and look back. And that would be me. And I would be, I didn't know what I was, I was this kind of inert, terrified object, hoping that that would come back. Now what happened was, uh, I said that, thinking, well, we're talking about the soul. And newspaper got hold of it, a popular newspaper got hold of it in a day or two after it went out, and started making hay with it. So I thought, well, I'd better tell the story, because this is ridiculous. So I uh, uh, offered it to... Um, I think it was the Times who gave me about 1,800 words, and I wrote about it in detail. About, and I'd had a, looking back now, there's absolutely no question, I had a severe nervous breakdown for about two years, two-ish years. And I, there was nothing I could do about it. Um, I mean, I don't quite know how I got through it, to tell you the truth, because I hadn't any words to describe it. I mean, how could, this is a tough little northern town in the 19 early 1950s. I mean, North West England, Northern Ireland, very, everybody knows what I'm talking about, the sort of town it was. And people didn't speak of, you know, they didn't speak of, my father never told me what he did in a war, never mind speaking about things like this. Um, so I, and I couldn't express it. I'm finding it quite difficult to express it now. But then, First of all, I couldn't express it. Secondly, there was nobody I could express it to. 
couldn't tell your father and mother, you couldn't tell the doctor. You could, so I had to hold that in. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was terrifying. And it was daily terrifying. I just thought part of my head was slipping out. And then it got to be chronic at one period for about, I can't, I'm just making these times up. Might have been two months, might have been six months, I don't know. Where I couldn't even pass a shop window. And if you caught sight of yourself, something would happen in your head again. And then uh, somebody picked it up in an organization for mental health called MIND and asked me if I'd be uh, president of the local association, which I was glad to be. Then I had another crack up in my late uh, 20s, very end of my 20s. Not, well, pretty bad, actually. Um, and I discovered that one of the things about mental health, well, there's so much to say, so I'll, be, I'll just make this one point, is that people were profoundly ashamed of it. They were really ashamed of it. I mean, coming out as a homosexual was very easy compared with coming out as somebody who'd really suffered massive depression. This was then. It's changed now, thank God. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll do it. I'll tell people that I got through it, and I've got a life, and I've got a career, and here I am. And I really was down there. And, um, and I'm very pleased that lots of other people are doing it, because it has to be brought out. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people suffering from this, people watching this program. There's one in five people go through something like that at that level, that level, that level, or that level in their lives. And they come through it, most of them. You can get through it, although you think you can't. Um, so one of the things that was marginally useful about uh, being somebody who's on television now and then is that, you know, you get a little bit of a blister if you say that, and other people, you get a lot of letters from people saying, Thank God you said that, because I thought I was the only one, and I didn't. And that's very, that's great. That's really, you feel you've, you know, you've done something useful. What do you think in the next 10 years uh, is going to happen to broadcasting? What would you like to see happening? <clears throat> well, what I'd like to see happen is, is, is the big broadcastings, the big terrestrial channels, four or five big audience channels holding on to the idea of doing quality work wherever it is, but insisting on doing quality work across the range. Quality light entertainment, high quality comedy, high quality drama, but high quality documentaries, high quality news, high quality arts programs, holding on to the whole baggage and saying to the British people, complicated life you lead. You're all members of majorities and minorities. You all want to go where you haven't gone before. You all want to be reassured with what you know already. I do. You do. We're going to keep the whole thing together somehow or other. That's what I'd like to see. But are you optimistic? Are you optimistic that the, the values that you have been championing in this conversation are are values we will be celebrating and seeing on the television in 10 years' time. The BBC is the key to the thing. The BBC is this massive organisation that we all pay for, with the poll tax, and all the evidence shows that most people are quite happy to do so. Um, that's got to stay resolute, the BBC, and continue to do you know, documentaries, arts programmes, exploratory programs, difficult programs, difficult. it's got to keep doing that because it will force the commercial channels, as it did in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, to somehow match them. Because if they don't, the BBC will take all the intelligence, middle class people away with it. And the terrestrial commercial channels can't afford that in every sense of the word for their self-esteem, for their own sense of their own honour as programme makers and for their customers, for their viewers and, and for their advertisers. So if the BBC, you know, doesn't listen to the siren voices of mere populism, really doesn't, you know, puts a cloth around its ears and sails on, then I think we stand a better chance of being in good shape than any other broadcasting country in the world.
We really do. But it's a big responsibility with those guys. And British television is the best in the world. There are, there are other countries that make tremendous programs. Um, even in areas where we think we're supreme, there are other countries that make tremendous programs. But across the waterfront, across the waterfront, there isn't any comparison. Melvin Bragg, thanks for talking to me. Thank you. I've enjoyed it.